Welcome back. Today we are talking again about how to find a home for your buyers, how to find inventory that is really not in the MLS. Obviously the MLS is your first line of defense, but we are giving you lots of great ideas on how to find other homes that are also going to be for sale. We do dust this podcast content off for this particular topic probably about every 90 days and update it and you know evolve it as our coaching clients use this information and they then put their own little twists on it, make our ideas better. So this is the the latest iteration of all the ideas. Now, um, here's the challenge Julie and I have. Yesterday we did the podcast on this very topic and today we've got... <laughs> as many uh, points as you like. I don't know exactly. I don't even know how many points are here. And there are too many. And we're not going to be able to get through all these because we only have a half hour. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to post all of these ideas, all of these, you know, really drilled down ideas in our newsletter. They're not going to be down below in the show description because iTunes and all the rest of it have clipped the amount of space we have. We used to put all of our notes down below, as you guys know, and they won't let us do it anymore. So what you have to do now is just go to harrisrealestatedaily.com and subscribe to the newsletter. Again, it's harrisrealestatedaily.com. The link to join the newsletter is down below, or you can just go to harrisrealestatedaily.com and subscribe. And that is where you'll find all of these notes. You definitely want to have these notes, and I'm going to give you the biggest reason why. We shared with you yesterday the three benefits to having all these notes. But really, at this point, hopefully all of you are paying attention to the fact that within a matter of months, you're going to have to start being able to present to a buyer why the buyer would want to work uh, you know, with you exclusively. In other words, you're going to have to compete for that buyer the buyer is going to have to sign an exclusive contract with you. The buyer is going to have to see the value in wanting to have you as their exclusive buyer's agent. Unlike before, there's no just automatic entitlement to a commission on the buyer agent side, um, you know, as there has been for really 30 years. Those days are over. Now you're going to have to compete for the buyers, just as uh, listing agents have been having to compete for their sellers, you know, since day one. So what do you do? You're going to have to have some unique selling propositions. You're going to have to be able to clearly explain the value that you represent, why that buyer would want to work exclusively with you. The notes from today's show and yesterday's show are going to be a great starting point along with all the information we give you in Premier Coaching because you can use these notes to show to your buyer exactly, or this prospective buyer, why they'd want to work exclusively with you and they're going to be blown away when they realize all the extra things you're going to be doing uh, to help them find a home other than what everyone else is doing, which is just looking in the MLS, which let's be honest, they can do themselves. Exactly. You should literally look at this as your checklist. My private coaching clients have this as their checklist and their accountability is so you've got these five buyers they are all in con or they're all pre-approved or they're cash. Why are they not in contract? Use this 20 point checklist on every single buyer. That way you can get them in contract or 23 points. Yeah, I 23 guess. points. We're probably yes. going to get through 10. But Julie, it's worth mentioning. They won't have to do all 23 of the points, right? No, they'll get to like number seven will be the jackpot for that particular exactly. buyer. And then they won't have to use the rest. The point is you've got to be more proactive than just the MLS. Well, in some markets, if they're just working, like if they romance a few of the new build reps, they're set. that could be a serious long-term honey hole for them. Or if they are in an, you know, there's, if we know somebody that um, does a lot with farmland and he sells it to developers, well, how's he have all these relationships with farm, uh, uh, you know, with farmland? Because guess what? His family's basically been in the farming business forever and they know all the farmers. That for him is going to be a never ending supply of inventory. You guys get the mm -hmm. point? So open your minds and don't be overwhelmed uh, to all these points because there are a lot. So pick and choose the ones that are going to make the most sense for you given your market. Very well said. Number seven, connect with assisted living care housing intake directors. Most people pay for their assisted care living costs by selling their homes and cashing out the equity. The housing intake coordinators are a great source of those leads. You can provide value by being a liaison between the homeowner and the director, and the director is going to love you for that. So you can modify your pre-listing package, an easy modification to include contacts for uh, estate sales specialists, pet rescue, moving and storage, et cetera, et cetera. Many of our coaching clients have embraced that, and what they like about this is they're virtually the only one talking to this particular resource. I'll tell you what I like best about that. It's a very professional, you know, sort of analytical driver type relationship. Yes, but also providing a lot of value. Yeah, so. it's it, it's in a lot of ways, to Julie's point, you won't be competing um, as frequently as you will. Like a new build rep's gonna have a lot of relationships with different uh, prospective agents that they can send their prospective listings to. But chances are the you know re assisted living uh, salesperson is really what they are. They're not gonna have a lot of agents that are gonna uh, try to solicit them for their listing opportunities. We should, you know, I'm making an assumption. So what happens is when a lot of times people go into assisted living, 
depending on what the the type of assisted living it is. And by the way, not all assisted living is the same. I mean, Julie and I used to live in Georgetown, which I think you know this. Georgetown mm-hmm. for decades was like the number one place for retirees to yes. live in the country. Mm-hmm. And there were all these uh, neighborhoods and communities that were built. And you just you wouldn't know that it was a um, a retirement community, other than the fact you had to be, dare I say, 55 or older. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So, but no kids, point being. And so this, you know, you'd walk, you'd drive through and there'd just be a lot of nice houses. And then you go into the neighborhood even further and then you'd see there were a lot of, you know, condos and you go even further than there. Okay. So what was happening? People would move into the communities. They start out with a house and then they might move to a, you know, condo, a little bit smaller, easier to take care of where they could start opting in for some, you know, maybe um, somebody comes in once a week and cleans the house or just different levels of health care. And as you, you know, move towards uh, the, uh, I think a lot of cases, there would be full on assisted living. Yes. That's so, right. And some of the others would just be, um, you know, straight up assisted living. You go in there and, uh, you know, you're going to be having to, you know, have your own uh, condo most likely. You're going to have your own. You could have pets, the whole thing. But there's going to be probably a nurse that's going to come by on a regular basis. So how does it work? When you meet with these guys initially, the salespeople, they're going to do. Uh, they're going to find out what your assets are because these places are really expensive, five thousand, six thousand, seven thousand per month. And because remember, it's including everything: the real estate, the taxes, the you know the actual healthcare workers. Uh, your food, every damn thing is included. It could be substantially more too. I might be, I mean, I've never shopped them before, so I really it's don't know. It's three to 500 a day typically. Oh, geez. Okay, yeah. so you guys get the point. Not cheap. So three to 500 a day, so it's up to $15,000 a month. Yowza. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, what they'll do is they're going to find out, well, can you p- self pay? And most people can't. So what they're going to do is then ask you for a list of your assets, and then you're going to list your house. Um, and then they're going to say, well, th- you can do one of two things you can sell the house yourself. Or you can essentially um, give us the house as part of the transaction, and then they'll then uh, sell the house. The assisted living places don't want the house. Both ways, they're referring those things out, the homes out to real estate agents to list and sell because they obviously want the money so these people could then move into their assisted living facilities. That is a nice, clean transaction for the most part. And that's a great continual source of business, uh, similar to, like for example, those of you who work um, the attorney sources. Probate. Probate, right. So for those of you guys work probate, we teach you guys how to do all this in premier coaching. That's Mm -hmm. another very steady, you know, it's so funny, Julie, every time we talk about probate, all of our um, uh, agents that we coach that specialize in probate cringe and tell us not to ever talk about it. they don't want us to mention it. (laughs) They don't want us to mention it. But probate, depending on your marketplace, is a cash cow. California, I'm talking to you. It could be an absolute huge source of business. indeed. All right, official point number eight. Find the notice of defaults. Search the zip codes for your, that your buyers are looking in for NODs and see if those homes fit your buyer's criteria. These are not usually yet listed, but they are usually motivated. There's lots of sources for NODs. A lot of people think that there aren't any right now. There aren't as many as there are you know, when there's a downturn, but that doesn't mean there's zero. You only need one for your buyers, and then you can control that transaction, the closing date, the, you know, you, and you know, you're, you're really providing a service for the person that can no longer make their payment. You're not competing for the business. You can organize the whole thing. In the best real estate market, there always are people that are going to, there's always going to be notice of defaults. There are always going to be foreclosures. In the best market, in the best part of the country, there's always going to be an element of distressed real estate. So it's not a, it's not a sign of a changing market. No. It's just normal. Point number nine. Yes, that's right. Things happen. All right, number nine, mine your own database. This is your past clients and people in your sphere of influence, otherwise known as shadow inventory. Who owns a home currently that may be a match for your qualified and motivated buyers? This creates potentially two to three transactions for you and accomplishes what your buyer wants to, you know, had, that they've hired you to do for their goal. And I have to say, Kristen Holly is my number one rock star on this. When she takes a new listing, she almost always says, I already have a buyer for that. She's a matchmaker. So look at your own database as your own private MLS. And when we get to point number 16, let's make sure we talk about uh, PM. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, Number 10, call 100% of your database to see who's curious about what their home is now worth in today's market. If they knew that their home is now worth X, what would that do to their plans? You know, not everybody is 
glued to real estate news like all of us are. Well, I mean, so again, we've had so many coaching clients that have made a fortune just off basically picking up the phone or going to the door. If you pick up the phone or go to the door with a prospective buyer or buyers, you're going to see a lot of people and you know the numbers make sense on for the sellers from the seller's perspective. You'll see a lot of sellers who are going to put their houses for sale in the next maybe 12 to 24 months that all of a sudden because it's they can hit the easy button and there's, you know, a buyer standing at their doorstep and all the math works who are going to uh, want to put the house in contract. Your buyer and that seller are going to have to work out the closing and possession and all the rest of it is still going to have to be negotiated. But you will be shocked how frequently, sell, there are, how many sellers there are out there that want to sell their house um, in the future that would make the future now. And I'm also going to throw this on there too. You're going to find a lot of sellers out there that have mortgages that are assumable. An assumable mortgage, is sent, it's called assumable with release. Write that down. If you've not been in the real estate business for a long time, you don't know what I'm talking about. So there's assumable with release, which means that you, that seller can sell the house to your buyer and the buyer can assume that seller's mortgage. So if the mortgage is at 3%, the buyer can uh, basically, essentially walk in and assume the seller's mortgage with release. In other words, they have to qualify. Now, is it the same level of qualification if, if the buyer were a new buyer purchasing the home? It's similar, but it's not as tough. Do the banks like to do these? Um, if the loan loan officers don't like to do them because they don't make any commission, the banks don't care. So as long as the person qualifies, they're going to be able to get the loan done. How does that actually happen? The seller has to call their lender and say, I have someone that wants to assume my mortgage. They're going to get transferred a couple times. They're going to be sent a package of paperwork. Then that buyer is going to have to fill out the package of paperwork and they're going to have to submit it to the servicer. And then the servicer is going to have to approve the assumption of the loan. I have not seen or know of any mortgages nowadays that are not assumable with release. There are probably some out there. So the question then is, well, the seller's got a bunch of equity in the house. What happens to the equity? Well, the buyer would have to come up with that equity in cash, or in some cases, maybe the seller's willing uh, to take, let's say, for example, they have 500,000 in equity, the buyer's only got 100,000. It's possible, not likely, but it's possible that that seller might be willing to take 400,000 as a second mortgage with the buyer putting down 100,000 and the bank will still do the, uh, you know, the assumable with release because the bank is um, essentially still has someone on the line and the seller with their equity becomes a second mortgage holder. This is kind of advanced coaching stuff, but the moral of the story is, is if you know now how to essentially have your buyer assume a mortgage that's at a super low interest rate, don't you think just knowing how to have this conversation with fluidity is going to give you an unbelievable advantage when you're convinced when you're uh, competing for those prospective buyers to be your exclusive buyers. In other words, when you're talking to a buyer and you're explaining to them how they might be able to assume a mortgage at 3% and none of the other buyer uh, buyer agents that they're talking to even have any clue what I'm talking about, don't you think that's going to give you an unfair advantage in the marketplace? That's called skills. Welcome to the new market. It's called articulating your value, isn't it? So there are ways in most MLSs to search for assumable. You can search by keyword and you know, that's a lot of Here, hidden inventory. But here's the all. problem. The yeah. listing agent's not gonna have a clue what I just said. No, the, it's just now starting to come in. I, I have our coaching clients and our coaches telling me that they're starting to see both, you combine two things, the assumable and the seller's second, right? So one of the one of the little twists to this that I've seen, I think Federico's working on one in LA, I believe it's him, where somebody says, I I would be a cash buyer up to X, right? I'm a cash buyer up to two million. They fall in love with a house that's two and a half. They're not gonna maybe even qualify for a half million dollar mortgage, or maybe they don't want to go through the hassle. But the seller is sitting on a huge mountain of equity. At least ask if the seller is going to do a second. That seller can make X amount of interest. All of this gets filed with normal paperwork by your title company. None of this is weird. It's just weird to the current, you know, zeitgeist of realtor well, brains. Well, it's, it's weird to the current crop of agents that have yeah, never had to do exactly. stuff like this. But this is again. Let's say that you won't find anybody that want, a seller that wants to actually become a, you know, a mortgage. mortgage. Is Older. it E or or? I always get this confused. Mortgagee is not me. That's right. Thank you. So it's it. You won't find very many sellers that want to be the mortgagee. That's for sure. But again. You might, and you might also find buyers that are going to be attracted to you and want to work exclusively with you just because you know how to have that conversation. Julie, next point. Next point is number 11. Search your neighborhoods for half-done flips. Okay, this is 
mostly happening in very urban environments like Seattle. I've had clients do this in LA a lot. The cost of building materials and labor has increased dramatically. Which flippers are feeling the pinch? Let, Certain buyers may be willing to purchase the home and finish it themselves or at least get into contract pending the finishing of the project. Okay, so along those lines, let's just drill down on this point. Um, so you are going to not only be talking directly to the people doing the flip, but the people doing the flip might not be in control of the property anymore because they were hard money, uh, the hard moneying the deal in the first place. What do I mean by all this jib jab? So let's say somebody bought the house at the top of the market thinking that they were going to flip it. So they didn't buy it that much under whatever the market value was. They got into the work. They realized the cost of labor has gone through the roof and all the rest of the things make it so the house no longer pens out. Well, generally speaking, a lot of these flippers don't use their own money. They're borrowing from hard money. Julie and I have done some hard money before. A hard money loan is near is only where somebody comes to you and they want to borrow money. It's collateralized by the mortgage. They're going to have some equity position in the property, plus hopefully they're buying it at a wholesale price. But the term of the loan is very short and very expensive. Normally, it's going to be six months, no interest. And after that, or maybe 90 days, no interest. And after that, they're going to have to start then making these hellacious payments. A lot of these um, flippers were also doing several hard money loans at the time, at, you know, at the same time, which basically the dominoes are all falling across the country. And a lot of these guys don't have the cash flow. But most importantly, the deal doesn't pen out anymore, meaning the houses are going back into the possession of the actual do people doing the flippers. They're looking for exits, but you're also looking for these hard money uh, you know, lenders who are, and oftentimes they're just individual mom and pops like Julie and I, who are looking for a way to basically get rid of this, you know, under this non-performing asset. How, again, this is all- To advanced, mitigate their risk. This is all advanced coaching type stuff, but you've got to realize there is opportunity everywhere it's just not on the MLS. Hopefully this has piqued your interest. There's so much opportunity out there with half done flips. That goes for developments too. You know, when Julie and I travel, we you'll see, you guys see these in your own community. You drive past a condo development and there's been chain, you know, there's that fence has been chained up for ages. What the hell is going on there? Well, I'll tell you what's going on. Exactly what I just said, just on a larger scale. Find out who the bank was that actually financed the deal. It's gonna be on a sign in front of the property. Call the bank. Ask what the hell's going on through development. Find another developer. The bank's going to be thrilled to get rid of that non-performing asset and probably also sell to another developer uh, at a very, you know, frankly, great price because they don't want to have that on their books anymore. That type of deal. You guys get it? Think out of the box. Yes. What's interesting about this podcast series to all of your bonus points here is that our premise was think out of the box to find something for your wayward buyers, right? But every single point that we've talked about, and even the points that we're not going to be able to get to today, every one of them doesn't just meet that criteria. Let's find something for your wayward buyer. It also can lead to the next thing, like you know your uh, half done flips and the investors. One thing leads to the next. Because if you're a developer, you're a flipper, it's probably not your only project. So you can only sell one thing to one buyer. It could be your next listing because you picked up the phone, because you door knocked, because you showed up on the, in their office. The, the, here's a, I'll give you guys a little mindset thing here. Say yes to everything and then figure it the hell out. Sort it S out later. Say yes to every opportunity and then figure out how to do it later. Don't start saying, I only list properties. <laughs> we hear this all the time. I only list properties in a certain community of a certain price point, you know, whatever. Okay, buena suerte. Good luck being successful in a market like this. Point number 12. Condo or apartment conversions. These are still newer, newer neighborhoods or buildings that have been rentals, but are now becoming resales. Again, more prevalent in the urban communities, but not always. Well, let's give an example. Julie and I own some condos in Las Vegas. And these condos were originally, when they were uh, originally built back in the bubble, they were like five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars Yes. Uh, and then when we bought them, we bought them all for less than $150,000, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. And so the, the masses of these condos, there was a lot of them and they were on the strip. They got uh, bought up by a gal that sold a technology business in San Jose or something. And she went in and bought all of them from, I think it was the FDA. No, no, she bought them all from BlackRock. Mm -hmm. And so she ended up with three or 400 of these things. About 300, yeah. Yeah, is that the number 300? Yeah. So, so uh, I guarantee you that she's going to leverage the market and start putting some of these for sale. And that's what her plan always was. And there's going to be lots of opportunities of condos, uh, condo developments that turned rental that will come back into the resale market. You have to keep your eyes open there. And a lot of this was essentially as a result of the real estate crash that happened in 07, 08. 
Yes, you make me think of something. I just read an article recently about uh, a lot of the new construction development is built to rent homes. So it looks yep. like a normal housing community. There's ranches and two stories and they're all uh, detached. I think New American is one of the big developers of that. And so what is their long-term plan? They're going to build it, they're going to rent them up, and then they're going to sell them off. Well, Not always, I, but it depends on what it is. I've not, everyone is predicting they would sell them off. I don't think they're ever going to sell them off. They might be writing it up. Well, I don't know. Heck yeah, they're going to write them up. They're never going to get rid of them yeah. because it's it's basically, it's a you know like almost like a treasury bond. Yeah. I mean, honestly, they're getting appreciation, they're getting depreciation, they're getting cash flow. They're never going to sell those things. Yes. Well, at least on that scale, there could be smaller guys that do. Well, the, okay. So along those lines, Julie and I are going to bounce off forever and come up with ideas, never get through all of our points, but that... You know, you listen to our podcast. You know what you signed up for. You know what you signed up. (laughs) Well, okay. So here's one. Um, A lot of those uh, new construction model homes. Yes. Right? So again, this is Julie and I. We actually were going to do this, but we didn't. So there are a number of builders that build, obviously, model homes. Model homes is where the new build reps, uh, you know, sits and they sell new construction. And these things are usually really, really nice. The developers don't want to own those homes and they'll sell them to prospective investors and you can get a really kick-ass price and then they lease them back to you while they're you know building out that community and then they build another one they build another one how many of the model homes in your particular neighborhood in your overall community are actually softly for sale or will be for sale soon or dr horton's building a new subdivision 20 minutes from your you know your office and they're about to basically uh, build a bunch of model homes. Maybe you figure out a way to put one of your buyers in contract on one of those. You're going to get paid. You guys get the whole point. Think out of the box. And you're helping the developer too because they want to get the next round of their construction loan you know, uh, released to them. And that's based on how many sales they have on the original project, right? Plus, you're buying a really decked out house with probably every amenity that you can get. Well, along those lines too is one of the things you and I used to do and we stumbled into this is we'll look for small builders, guys that build like one or two homes per year, but they're expensive and um, they don't usually list. They're trying to basically find a buyer and you know, the whole thing. And they mm-hmm. take forever to build them. Yep. We would look for those and we definitely, we you and I did incredibly well, especially in the very expensive properties mm-hmm. that way. Love that business. All right, well, we would be remiss if we didn't mention number 13, expired listings, recent expireds and older expireds. You probably can get them their price in today's market. Offer to provide a new comparative market analysis and see what that does to their plans. Again, here's a situation where it's not actively in the MLS. You are not going to be competing and you're having a bonus situation where you turn that expired seller into your next buyer. I'm going to add to that expireds and withdrawns. Now, why would there be a withdrawn? Listing agents are going to hate me for saying this, but it is true. A lot of times what a a listing and a more experienced agent will know is that they, as soon as their listing shows up in the MLS as being expired, there will be some agents that will try to solicit that freshly expired listing to become their listing. And so what, you know, a lot of listing agents will do is it will never show up expired. It'll show up uh, either withdrawn or temporarily withdrawn. In many MLSs, you can't solicit a withdrawn or temporarily withdrawn listing. It's considered to still be, you know, a listing of that particular uh, listing brokerage. So they will change the status sometimes to which you're going to have to do a little bit extra homework. And I'll tell you the easy button to figure it out. Go into the MLS, find out when it, that withdrawn originally got listed. And then let's say you determine that it got listed, uh, you know, 180 days ago, six months ago. Well, then go to see what that broker's typical listing times are based on the other listings you've seen that they sold in the MLS. And if you notice there's 180 days, chances are they're just playing uh, the game of making it showing up as withdrawn or temporarily withdrawn versus actually a true expired. Um, so why would a listing agent do that? Because the biggest competitor you'll have when you're hunting expired listings is the previous listing agent. You know, that's just a fact. And so you're going to be able to go and have a conversation with that, uh, you know, now actually expired listing. And you might already have a buyer for that. Just proceed lightly. Know your MLS rules. Uh, obviously, don't cross any signs. You might end up in, have, in end up having to call the actual listing agent and say, what's the story with this listing? It's showing up withdrawn, but I have heard that it's actually expired and see what happens. Yes. And there's actually a specific MLS rule. I always have to look this up. So grain of salt, you know, you guys look it up yourselves that says, if I'm an agent and you've got that expired or withdrawn and I call you and ask you. Uh, what was the the date of the exp- expiration and do you have any extensions and what's going on and you don't call me back there is a statute of limitations on that I think I think it's like after two weeks then you're able to call the seller directly so that's kind of like a workaround to the rule well I would not do it in a call I would do it in a writing so that they can't say they never received your message but yes I smart. do know what you're talking yeah. about yep 
Okay. Interesting. Okay, so last but not least, unless you want to do some more. Point number 14. Number 14, of course, for sale by owners. Those are otherwise known as unrepresented sellers, especially if they've been on the market for more than two weeks or two weekends and still haven't sold. That seems to be the magic pocket of time for most FISBOs, that they've had it after their second open house. If they're not dripping in offers, they're over it in most cases. That's right. And so remember, most FISBOs don't uh, list themselves, or they list themselves rather, because they just don't know a real estate agent. Expired and for sale by owners, we talk about endlessly in Premier Coaching and on this podcast. Including and I, scripts. And I do want to get to two more points, or three more, well, actually two more points okay. for sure. Do you want to choose? Uh, no, I want to get okay. to 15 and 16. So okay. let's do both. You got Absentee it. owners. Absentee owners. Okay. Uh, there's Don't a, use that link. Okay. Uh, get the address. Make sure it's not already listed and connect with the owners to see their plan for their property. Offer a free CMA, comparative market analysis, for them to, to help them decide. What is an absentee owner, Julie? An absentee owner is, let's say, I mean, technically our house in Murphy, we're an absentee owner. We don't live there full time. It's an investment property. Uh, places like Phoenix and Vegas are just dripping in absentee owners. A lot of the South has that. An absentee owner is where basically the uh, property tax bill is, is married and mailed to a set a different address so if one two three elm street's property tax bill is being mailed now the problem with that is obviously a lot of people do it digital nowadays but that's what you can tell whether the address where the notifications are sent is not the actual address of the property that's how a lot of these companies that search out absentee owners that's the information that they pull from and you might be in a market where there's tons of absentees. The absentees might be vacation homes for them. Might again be, uh, you know, what our next point is talking about short-term rentals. Lots of reasons to hunt ex uh, absentee owners. I know Julie and I have had coaching clients in Florida in particular, where there's just gobs and gobs of absentees, mm -hmm. coastal properties, big condo developments, where we've had agents that just all they do, and it's really awesome business because they're not competing for it. Nope. The other agents that are just mailing postcards and all this other crap, you know, the postcards don't get forwarded to where the person actually lives. Nope, you can't door knock them either because exactly. they're not there. Exactly, so if you call them, hey, there it is. If you call them, you'll actually find yourself stumbling across a lot of business that it's not going to require you have really, you know, you're not going to necessarily have to compete. So I'm not saying don't have skills, but I'm saying in that particular case, when you call up that absentee owner and you tell them their condo is worth this, where maybe they weren't even paying attention to it and they're not using it. They thought they're going to be going down there every two weeks, but they're not. The turns out the lake property isn't really what they wanted. Just, you know, too long for them, whatever the reason for buying it. Uh, maybe not have worked out, so make sure you call them. And this leads right into point number 16. Number 16, vacation rentals, VRBOs. That's vacation rental by owners. Look at the rental history and pursue property owners who own homes in the areas that you or your buyers want to see if they would consider selling. Their phone numbers and email addresses are almost always listed online. Many VRBOs are experiencing new rules that limit their rental options, thus reducing their profitability. That's a big thing both in buildings with condos as well as certain communities that have said, oh, no, 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 you might have bought that during the pandemic thinking that you're going to VRBO that, you know, weekly. But no, we have this city rule that says you can't do that for some cities. Uh, I think maybe it was Hilton Head. Maybe Jenny told me that it was. I think it's six months. There's some communities in California that is 30 days or Didn't less. Did they do that in Carmel by the Sea? Yeah, it's 30 days. And now that's, of course, in the golden rectangle. If you're outside of well, that, you don't have the same. It's in Carmel by the Sea. Yes. It's no rentals for less than 30 days. But in Carmel, it's, which is right around it, it's basically you can yeah. do daily rentals. You have to know your, your actual rules. And there's also instances, I know, like in Long Beach, um, certain condo, you know, mid rises, high rises will have their HOA rules that the HOA has recently said, we don't want any short term rentals. You're just not going to do it. This is a full time yearly rental, if rental at all. And then the building next to them will have totally different rules. Well, let's just be honest. If you had to live next door to a VRBO that was being constantly <laughs> rented out for people that are just staying there overnight to have parties. You wouldn't want that either. That sucks for you. Yeah, it just totally. does. And, you know, in condo buildings, a, a building that's um, like, again, coaching here, but if you are trying to get a FHA buyer approved to buy a condo and they're the percent of owners versus renters, if that percent is too favoring the uh, renters, you're not going to be able to get financing in there. Well, that guess what? That also applies to VRBOs. So the reason that a lot of these condo developments in particular and communities in a whole, but condos mostly, don't want short-term rentals is because it really does depreciate the properties because the properties become unfinanceable. So before you think about the socialization of real estate, the reality of it is, is they're protected the value of the asset. A lot of people don't think about that because yep. they love the salacious headlines. But I'm going to add to that. So the VRBO thing is a gold mine. How do you find them? Go to VRBO or 
home away or whatever it is, and then put in the address or put in the areas in which you live and then just do the generalized search any days, any amount of money and look to see how many show up. And again, don't be shocked when you see how many there are in some of these markets. There are literally thousands. And then Julie, you know, we tell you how to do this in Premier Coaching, but it's not hard. You can go in there and see the rental property history of that VRBO. And many markets, because a lot of people were buying these uh, during the low interest rate COVID environment, there are way too many VRBOs and the math just does not pan out. And a lot of these owners want to put them for sale. They're not local. It's a pain in the ass for them to put them for mm -hmm. sale. Maybe they're still holding on to the fantasy that they're going to short term rental this thing. But you guys remember when that was a big trend in real estate, all these you know, millennials on Instagram talking about how they're billionaires from owning a, an army of VRBOs. It, you know, they would rent a VRBO and then they would essentially rent it for more. All these, th or they do a year long lease on a property and then they short term rent it. Sublease it. Yeah. Whatever happened to all of those folks and all those stories on Instagram? Yes. Hmm, Curious, suspicious. Isn't it? Yes. Yeah, you know what's also, uh, my clients that do this, they also look at the comments on those VRBOs because if you see that somebody's like had you know, five comp, uh, comments in a row that are like, I would never stay here again because the new construction right next door and there's parties and this and that. That's probably a frustrated owner that's sick of dealing with this. For sure. So you can do a lot of forensics. You can also use their mapping widget to see, you know, where are all of the pockets of that. So here's nice the, skill to have. Here's the bonus point I wanted to add on to that one is um, property managers. Again, property managers are going to be a, you'll say, well, why would they want to list it with me or refer me to the listing? Okay, so there's different ways of thinking about this. First of all, a lot of property managers just want to pro manage property and they don't want to actually uh, list the properties or frankly work with anybody other than tenants. There are, you know, that's a business model. Not saying it's one I would do, but it is a business model. So they'll refer their listing leads out. So there's that. But what if there's a property manager that will list their own properties? They know of, let's say they're managing 200 properties and they know of every year that 10 of them or 20 of them are going to go for sale. They have a real steady stream of consistent listings, which again, if you treat property management like that, where you're going to build future listing inventory and you're making money from management and you're making money from you know the real estate real resale aspects, that's a better business model. But they will have, they will know what's going to be coming for sale from the properties they manage. And if you've got a prospective buyer, obviously, and they have a seller that's going to be popping something for sale sometime in the near future, you just love match that buyer to that prospective listing. You guys get it? You got to think out of the boxes. This is the reason that we're telling you that the, now, so I want you to think about this. If you are an owner of a management company and you've got 200 properties for sale and you know every single year you're going to have 20 come for sale and you know chances are, uh, especially considering the inventory mark, the inventory challenge that the markets have right now. Why would you put those in the MLS if you can sell them to your own buyers? You wouldn't. No. Okay. Or sell them to the buyers of these buyers agents who are smart enough to call you asking about inventory you have coming for sale. That's what's happening to the marketplace. That's the market has evolved. Market forces have made it so non MLS listings are clearly becoming one of the primary sources for buyer agents to find homes for their buyers. And again, lean back into the fact that all these points are absolute gold mines for you to validate your value when you're trying to get that buyer to commit to you as a exclusive buyer's agent. And if you want all these notes, because we only went through point 16 and Julie has 23 points in addition to all the ones we obviously shared with you that we thought of as we were going through all this. Notice I said thought of because our content is always evolving. Julie and I are constantly changing and updating all the, you know, really our approaches to some of these ideas because technology, AI, and all the rest of it is really yes. causing some of these to work even better. Um, and some of the sometimes ideas, you know, they don't work anymore, so we remove them. But if you want all these notes from any podcast, but especially today's and yesterday's, make sure you subscribe to harrisrealestatedaily.com. Harrisrealestatedaily.com is our exclusive newsletter. It is free, and you will then have access to all of our notes. In addition to that, a lot of exclusive content. So that is where the remainder of points for today's show are going to be. Tomorrow, I'm going to try to coax Julie into creating a new podcast where we're really going to focus in on the buyer pre-qualification script because here's the unfortunate truth. A lot of you are working with buyers that frankly will never buy even if you show them the perfect home because one of the you know pre-qualification questions that you should have asked them wasn't asked. So we're going to be going over that on tomorrow's podcast. Is that you? You're shaking your head. You can, are you? Uh, I have to, yes, I'm. You have to write I, it. I, I have, yes. I'm just cleaning up some editing and making sure I'm covering all the bases. That's okay, all. Okay, cool. So that's tomorrow's podcast. And then the next day is going to be Ask Me Anything. Is that right? Yes. yes. So Ask Me Anything is our weekly show where you can ask us anything. So if you have any questions you'd like to submit, it can just be about anything. You know, some of the questions we got in are kind of funny and not appropriate to read on the podcast, frankly. 
or they well, might we be, get to decide or they might be overly personal and you know you thought julie and i'd be a good source for you to ask the question a lot of questions i was surprised that we were getting not surprised kind of pleased were about you know relationships marriages working with your spouse and you know the questions were a little bit too hard for us to re-engineer to make for uh i think mass consumption on the podcast but we did answer directly so whatever questions you have about whatever topic and a lot of you guys are asking about julie and i's workout um you know we call it our daily torture session yes um, we post on instagram we're going to be doing more so a lot of people have asked about what our actual routine is we're going to be sharing more about that i do love the fact that you guys are sharing with us what your routines are on instagram as well um so yeah there it is. So our next day, if you have any questions and you want us to answer, hopefully, whatever questions you have you'd like to ask, please submit those questions to me directly by texting me 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206. In the meantime, have a fantastic day and we'll talk with you on the show tomorrow.